head of the United States Air Force, Strategic Air Command, First Tactical Air Command, Fighter Wing, 3525 Pilot Training Wing, Command um, during the uh, Vietnam Air. So her presentation is Women in the Armed Services. Barbara, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. not that many of us, so I'm talking for all of us, um, but once upon a time, closer, a closer. There you oh, I, I, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing this behind me. Maybe I shouldn't stand in front of that. I, I think that's picking up that. Is that over again? Okay. Yeah. Once upon a time. You can still play with it while you're doing it. Okay. Once upon a time, um, before I went to high school, they said, um, when you go to high school, you can have three choices. Whoops. You have three choices. I put a button here. Good. Okay, you can go, you can be college prep, or you can be administration, or you can be general. And my mother said to me, you are not going to college. You have two younger brothers, they're going to college. You are gonna be a secretary. You have to take administration in high school. I had no choice. So I'm taking administration in high school, trying to think what I'm gonna do with the rest of my life. And uh, I was sitting in the guidance counselor's office one day for a meeting, and I saw on a poster, on a, a folder, of a girl in the Air Force. I didn't know there were girls in the Air Force. I knew there were girls and women in the, in the Army, but I didn't know there were women in the, in the Air Force. And that set me off. I researched, I talked to recruiters, I did everything I could. I went to open house at McGuire, McDill Air Force Base, no, McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey and talked to some other women who were in, and I was sold. So um, I graduated from high school, and two weeks later, I was taking my oath. Where do I hit here? Point this here, or? You don't have to point it. Okay. Just, just hit the button. I'm at the button on top. Okay, hold on here. Or the white button. The white button on top. The, the, the white button, button on top will, will take you forward. The one on the bottom okay. will okay. take you back. So this is just a little story of my experience in the Air Force. I didn't get to shoot any guns or go to war, but I did my part. Um, so this is a swearing in. Now, they, the state of New Jersey only took three enlisted women every month. You had to have 15 character references, five credit references, take an extensive test and a physical examination, went through all that, and this is me and the other two ladies that were sworn in that day in New Jersey, and we put on a plane to San Antonio, Texas for basic training at uh, Texas. So, do you know how they wake you up at WAF in basic training? They take a tin can and roll it down the highway, down the hallway. Attention airmen, attention airmen, it's now 0445. You will get up, you will have your hair combed, fresh lipstick on, and you will smell sweet. You have 15 minutes to fall out on the walk for chow. Do it, do it, move it. Now, sometimes we got 30 minutes and 45, depending on when our flight had to go to chow, but that was every day in basic, and it's only basic. So we got fitted for our uniforms, we learned all the requirements of maintenance for the uniforms, which was extensive. And marching, now I had been in marching band um, in grammar school and high school. I did a lot of marching, so that was no big deal at all. Uh, classroom training, physical training, and we received our medical shots just like everybody else. Um, now I hit the button again. Top. There you go. There's a little delay on it. Okay. Shoes are very important. This is me in my bathrobe, in my barracks, cleaning. They gave us two pair of black shoes and a pair of heels, and they had to be shiny enough to see your face in. So um, a lot of time was spent on um, doing shoes and then ironing everything needed to be ironed. And well, there's, we made a lot of friends in the ironing room uh, doing that together. Nothing that everybody else didn't do anyway. This is my flight at graduation. This is me, way over here in the corner. I was the guide on bearer. Now when you first go in and they line you up, we do a right face, and they say, if you're taller than the person in front of you, tap them on the shoulder and trade places. 
Then do a right face. And again, if you're taller than the person in front of you, tap them on the shoulder and trade places. So I'm way in the back end here now. And then they come along and say, here, you're the guide on. And they gave me this pole to carry. Because the person with the shortest um, stride gets to set the pace. So that was lots of fun. Um, but it was really cool because every time we went to eat, see, each squadron is in, in a, there's four rows in the squadron, and I'd have to go stand in front of whoever was the first to go in the chow hall. So I got to eat chow first because I had to be out first so I could stand there and get everybody else to line up behind me. Lots of fun. Um, so my first assignment was at, River, at uh, March Air Force Base. Um, I was just in personnel waiting for somebody to come and tell me what to do. Um, March is a stack numbered area. Back in the day, okay, this is, I, this is 1967 when I went in. Back in the day, March was a numbered Air Force. SAC, centered in Omaha, Nebraska, Strategic Air Command, had three numbered Air Forces. They had 15th Air Force in March. They had another one in New Hampshire and another one in uh, Louisiana, and that was the uh, Air Force stuff. So my job was uh, administrative assistant to the captain in protocol. So I reported to a captain who reported to a colonel who reported to a three-star general. I didn't have a whole lot of in between him. Um, but my job in protocol was to assist in preparing briefings and tours for dignitaries. I helped arrange seat charts for luncheons and dinners. I met guests at the front gate and uh, I stuck a lot of name tags on people. Um, but let's just be sure we know the difference between SAC, TAC, and MAC. SAC, Strategic Air Command, is the bombers and the refuelers, KC-135. Look at that, that 62. That's not four engines, that's eight engines on that thing. Think about 1967, stick eight engines on a plane. That's why the B-52s went so high and so fast. Um, and then they could went, went so far away that they had to have refuelers, so the, uh, refu the KC-135s go with that. So here's a meeting at the front group at the gate. I met the Council General of Japan and the Chief of Staff of the Indonesian Air Force. This is me meeting a group of um, ladies from the Freedom Foundation because <clears throat> they couldn't let somebody just drive around the base. So we had to go meet them at the base and take them to wherever they were going. If it was a group, we'd have a bus that we'd put them on. but get them started on their little tour. Um, and I did a lot of, um, you wouldn't believe what you had to go through to set up name tags for a lunch or a dinner or anything that they have. I mean, you have to know everybody's time and service, time and grade, and what their, what their current um, dis uh, job description was, because they may need to go on the head table or someplace else based on any one of those things. There were a lot of discussions as to who sat where and why. You know, then you walk in and they give you tag and you just go sit where they tell you to sit. But uh, there's a lot behind it. Um, when you're a basic, you have no stripe. And when you graduate from basic, you get your first stripe, and that's an airman. Second stripe, I mean, first stripe, yes. First stripe is an airman. Second is airman first class. Anyway, I made it to three, I made E4 under five, um, staff sergeant. And that's my colonel giving me my badge. Now, if you look very closely at these two pictures, there's me on the right side here, and that's Betty Davis over there in the corner. And if you've ever watched the Beverly Hillbillies, there's Jethro. So, <laughs> whoever showed up, you know. Um, so, and the other thing I learned when I first got to the Air Force was that, hey, they give court in college courses on the base. Now, remember I was told I'm not going to college. But they have the college courses on the base. So I just took a course in sociology, and it was really interesting, and I got an A. And I went, hey, I could do this. I could actually go to college, and, and if you got 30 credits, you could apply for ROTC, and then you could get full college, and then you could be an officer. That was my goal. Okay, I'm going to do that. So I took my first class, and then wherever I was, I was always taking college courses. Um, and unfortunately, I really love my job at March. And, but um, the lady that had my job in, at SAC headquarters in Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha got a job someplace else, and all of a sudden I got some orders to go to Nebraska. 
I wasn't really thrilled about that. I love being in California. I just bought a little MG Midget, and I drove my MG Midget <laughs> from California to uh, Nebraska. Um, and I got my uh, next promotion, but uh, I was in psych, psych headquarters. So I didn't get to, to shake hands or anything. Jimmy Stewart actually walked by my desk one day. But other than that, because um, I was over in the corner, over in the corner, um, the, there was the back door to the general's briefing room. So if anybody really important wanted to come in the back door, they had to go right past my desk. I was just at an attention all the time. But that was cool. Um, in the briefing room, they had these telephones that when the general, four-star general, when the general was in a meeting, they would pull these phones over and put in front of him. One was that went downstairs to the underground command post, and the other one went, I think, to NORAD or something like that. But he had a phone right in front of him that he could pick up, and somebody would pick that up right there. And normally, the sergeant in my office would straighten this up. But one day, he was busy, and he said, you know, go straighten up the uh, briefing room after the general left. Now, here's this phone, and it's on a wire. So I, I grabbed the wire, and I grabbed the phone. And you're supposed to just give the phone a tug, and the wire would go back. But the wire went, and the phone went. I'm, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And here these five guys just laughing like hell. <laughs> I picked up the general's telephone, but... I let my sergeant do that after that. Um, anyway, SAC has to be ready at any time for hostile enemies in the United States. So that's the underground command post is right there at SAC. We gave a lot of tours of the underground command post. That was something that protocol office did. But in the event that um, SAC, that underground command post is taken out, command reverts to one of the numbered air forces I talked about. And in the event that those numbered air forces are taken out, there was Looking Glass. Looking Glass was a aircraft that had a general officer on it and was in the air 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If anything happened to everything, we would still have command in that airborne command post. And we knew that because the WAF barracks is right at the end of the runway and Looking Glass took off every night at midnight. Thank you very much. Um, but, yeah. So while I was at Offutt, I met and married my husband. He had been in Vietnam before I met him. He worked in the emergency room. And he um, decided that he was going to re-enlist. So what we did was we took a map. And, and he, when you re-enlist, you get your base of preference. So we laid out the map of the United States. And we're going to go, let's go to Florida. I've never been there. Yeah, OK, I knew somebody at McDill. Let's go to Florida. So he puts in for his um, base of preference. And once we were married, I came back with my marriage certificate and put it for a joint spouse tour. And in a month or two, we were on our way to Tampa, Florida, McDill Air Force Base. Now, at, at, um, women in the Air Force at that time could only be stationed on a base that had a WAF barracks. Unless you were married, then you can live off base. And there's some other rules about higher ranks and stuff. but. Uh, so there was only five enlisted women on the whole base there. This is a tactical aircraft as opposed to strategic. Tactical aircraft shoots things down. Um, and that's what we had at Bill. Um, so I was doing great in my job. I was taking college courses. I'm so into that, doing that. Um, but my husband wasn't happy with his job. He had been, like I said, in the emergency room. He was, he's a real party guy, and he's okay, we just hang around, and then there's an emergency, we take care of it, and then we hang around some more. But here at McDill, he got into intensive care, and he did not like that at all. I was just walking around making sure these people are okay all the time. And, and so he says, if you re-enlist, we could get a base preference and go someplace else, and I could get a new assignment, and then you could get pregnant and have a baby. I, I, I'm going to college. I, I, wasn't thinking about having a baby. And oh, one other rule, women at that time when they went in would not be sent to Vietnam on your first enlistment. But once you re-enlist, all bets are off. So, you know, it was, no. <laughs> so anyway, um, I gave in because I was the wife. And so I 
re-enlisted and we laid out the map of the United States and said, where should we go? Let's go to Arizona. Yeah, I, I had been to Arizona when I was stationed at March and Arizona school, let's go there. Okay, so the next thing we go is to Williams Air Force Base in Arizona. That was an ATC base, Air Training Command. And Williams is where they sent um, pilots the first time they started learning how to fly. So if somebody joined the Air Force and then was taught to fly or somebody knew how to fly, they were taught how the Air Force expects you to fly, that kind of thing was being done at Williams Air Force Base, air training. And my job there was in base operations. Um, oh, I, I forgot to mention, when I was in McDill, because I had been in the general's office at SAC, I had to have a very high um, security clearance over top secret just in case I ever picked up a paper or heard something or something. So when I got to McDill, um, I was in the Office of Operations. Um, anyway, <laughs> we, what we did was we um, planned. Air Force wrote a plan, Plan 264B. If China attacks us, we can plan 264B, plan 1969, plan. They had all these plans, so if somebody attacks us, the higher up in the, in the um, Pentagon can say implement plan 234B, and they know what to do. Well, we would take plan 234B and break it down to what the TAC fight, first TAC fighter wing had to do, and then we'd do that again. So I typed World War III over and over and over again, and that's what I did at McDill. But now I hear at Williams is the base operations. And in base operations, we took care of the library and the commissary and the golf course, um, doing a lot of bookkeeping, which I knew how to do, doing a lot of typing. So again, it was, it was that, but I was still uh, taking classes too. And then I got pregnant. So, oh, and this is an article of the five of us at Williams Air Force Base. Um, this is me on the right talking about what it's like to be a woman in the Air Force and what our job was and um, that's what we did. But so obviously I became pregnant and I went to the doctor on the base who told me the rule's changing. The old rule said the minute you're pregnant you're out of here. But the new rule said um, six months leave of absence, we're going to get maternity uniforms, and as far as when you leave is something when you and your doctor decided it wasn't. In. So the doctor says, we know the rule's going to change, I'm just going to put your folder here on my desk. Like I said, there's only five enlisted women on the base anyway. It's no big deal. I'm going to put your folder in my desk here and just don't say anything to anybody right now um, because we'll wait for the rule to change, okay? So we're good. And then I get a call from this, the chief enlisted guy that runs personnel. He says, I need to talk to you and your husband. Don't come down here without your husband. I got all this stuff to lay out because you're, you've got orders to go to Vietnam. So, okay. So we go down to personnel and he gets all his papers out in front of him. He says to my husband, now, do you want to accompany your wife to Vietnam? He goes, hell no. So when he gets up off the floor, I go, what's that conscientious objector thing? He goes, all right, all right, here. Here's a, here's a list of all the reasons you can use to get out of a shipment in Vietnam. And one of the reasons was that two siblings couldn't be in Vietnam at the same time. Remember once a long time ago, there were three brothers that got killed together? And they changed that rule and they said, we're not sending brothers and sisters to the war zone at the same time. You can take turns. So my brother Tom had just, was two years younger than me and after my mother saw my success in the Air Force, she found a good place for Tom to go. Um, Tom was a weather observer, not a forecaster, an observer. So when he was um, working here, he, he worked in this shack on, on the runway in between the two runways to tell the pilots what the weather was like right where they are. And then when he went to Vietnam, they put him with a group of army guys hustling through the jungle because whenever there was attack on something, they had to get as close to it as they could so he could observe the weather and tell them what it was like where they were going. He slept in the, in the jungle with his gun, all kinds of stuff. But anyway, he was in Vietnam. So, okay, so then by the time 
I tell the sergeant that, he goes and looks everybody up, figures what he's going to do, and then I'm obviously pregnant, and the rule had changed, and I went back and I said, Sergeant, oh, would, would you send a crib with me when I go to Vietnam? He goes, get out, get out. <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, okay. So, so anyway, uh, so then I got out and I had to go to personnel and hand in my green card and get an orange dependent card. And uh, my daughter was born two months later. And then I had a second baby, a son, two and a half years after that. And then I divorced my husband. So, um, <laughs> we were only married five years. So I went back to New Jersey and the good old GI Bill saved my life. Um, I had, I mean, here I am, a single mother, two kids, nothing except the GI Bill. Thank you very much. The GI Bill, welfare, food stamps, any other benefit. Um, I spent 18 months going to New Jersey, taking every course I could. I got very into, you know, I was working on accounting, but then I got very into um, computer systems. Big deal in, back in the 70s, right? Um, so then one day, the VA said, we have, to, you have a mandatory VA meeting have to come. The veterans filled up two auditoriums. There were so many veterans. And they said, you can't just go to college and make money. You have to actively pursue a degree. And we all went, whoa. So <laughs> when I added up everything I had, I already had an associate's in accounting, and I only needed one more course for another associate's in computer systems. So, and there wasn't a four-year college near where I grew up in New Jersey. I was happy to have the two-year. So I went back to good old Arizona, and I took all my credits to Arizona State and sat down with them and said, you have enough credits that you can earn two degrees in here. And that's what I did. So I had a degree in accounting. This is a girl who was not supposed to go to college. I got a degree in accounting and a degree in computer systems, and I wound up designing automated accounting computer systems. Um, and I worked for 43 years designing and programming these. I also uh, got so involved in computers, I mean, sorry, in communications type. Think about an inbound 800 number answering service. We're answering the phone for 400 different companies nationwide, and they were doing it all manually, and I designed a computer system to put the information in, um, as well as then I got involved in the, com in the communication side of it and programming um, telephone systems. So, you know, the difference between an ACD and a PBX. An ACD is an automatic call distributor. That's when you've got a lot of people answering the same phone number, and the call that's been idle the longest goes to the person that's been available the longest and works that out. There's a lot of rules to it. But that's what I did, and I just retired in uh, November 2021. Um, before I planned to do this, I went to a recruiter and I got the name of a female recruiter because I wanted to know what's different now for women in the military than when I was. Well, for one thing, they don't even call them wafts and waves and wax anymore. They're just there. There's, she said, what's a wave? What's a whack? I go, what? And um, they don't have women's um, barracks anymore. There's, because, you know, each barracks is like, you know, the, the people you work with and there's separate rooms for women in, in all the barracks. Um, now that they have people going to college, there is the community college of the Air Force on base, and you can get up to 15 credits that they'll pay for, and then they'll give you another $4,500 to help you pay for all of that. So more information available on airforce.com, and that's my little story. Does anybody have a question? That's all right, good. Question. No, women were not given firearms nor um, obstacle course. And uh, that was 1960. And the other question was what? 
How long did you take? Six, six weeks. Six weeks. Six weeks. Yes. Wow. Hey, my, my name is Bob Williams. My grandson is part of the Air Force Base Force for Company. He's also in the Air Force Reserve. He works for the company and does the dynamics on the lakes. What are the lakes? Is the 47 uh, tanker that's set up right now? KC 135. Huh? KC 135. I know this. That's the one they had then. I know they have other. I'm sorry. There's a problem than that. The LC that one. Four six. Okay, I don't. I don't know what to say. God bless. Okay. <laughs> Somebody else had a question over here. Right here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when I saw the topic was going to be women uh, uh, in the service and women in the Air Force, I thought it'd be kind of, I, I just would like to give a shout out to the gals that uh, I had an opportunity to work very closely with. As a C-141 pilot for a while, uh, these were the uh, flight nurses. Oh, yes. They, uh, they were officers. Yes. But uh, we had an agreement uh, as a pilot from the cockpit bulkhead forward was ours, and from the cockpit bulkhead back was her domain. And they usually have a, med, uh, a senior uh, officer as the senior nurse, and then she'd have some of the younger nurses with her that were supported by the med teams, and uh, they were just amazing. Sometimes we need turbulence, so we'd be bringing back soldiers from, uh, that were stabilized in, uh, Oken, or in uh, Japan, in Yakota, and then we'd fly them back to Alaska and then back to the United States. Uh, a lot of times we are hitting turbulence back there, these guys are yelling, they're screaming, they're throwing up because they're sick and it's just these gals are slipping and sliding and trying to keep these guys comforted. It was an amazing profession and every one of them absolutely loved the job. And so I'd like to give a shout out to the flight nurses that were in the military and uh, thought that was important. Thank you. I agree, sir. Thank you. So beautiful so first of all, wow. We had a question over here. First of all, you did an awesome job. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, the reason she only had six weeks of boot camp, fellas, is because women are a little bit smarter than us, and we're not so smart. It takes us twice as long to figure it out, right? So um, the question I have for you, um, what's your, re like, I know, I don't know how much speaking you've done. It seems like you've done a lot of public speaking. You're so good. Um, have you, what's the reception that you've seen from girls uh, to you speaking about this and everything? Do you see this, are you seeing positive feedback from the interaction you've had with younger ladies at all yet? Or what are you seeing so far? There's, there's interest. Um, it's like I've only gone to one high school so far. Uh, but I did speak to a number of women and, you know, I said, hey, if you don't know what you're going to do in your life and you want to go someplace that they, they pay you, they feed you, they clothe you, they give you a place to live, they train you how to do the job, and then they give you a job. What more do you want? You know, you can do that, and then once you go through, you know, if you're not going to go to college, I say, hey, if you're going to go to college, by all means, go to college, right? And then you can talk about being, enlist, being an officer and all that sort of thing, which is what my end goal was back when. But, um, no, I, I encourage them, you know, there's a lot of girls that don't know what to do. And just living at home and getting a job may not be the right thing for them. I, I wanted to go out on my own. I had a very overpowering mother who told everybody what to do, and I just had to say bye. I love my mother, but I had to say bye. So. Yeah, Barbara, the, uh, during your presentation, you were you, several times you talked about being one of a very small number of women in the Air Force at any given at base. Yes. How were you? accepted and treated by the largely male force that you were working I never had a problem. Um, everybody was very military and you know you just um, just like you work with a lot of men in an office. Uh, you work with a lot of men in, in these offices as well and there were a lot of women working in the offices that were not enlisted. They were just you know civilian people that were working in the office so there's a lot of... Um, back in the day they first let women in the military during the war to free up men to go front to you know fight on the front we don't need a man sitting there typing but the world works on typing at that point you know if it wasn't on a piece of paper it didn't happen and there wasn't any computers <laughs> so 
it was a big deal to have things typed. But no, I never um, had any problem with that. Any other questions for Barbara? Yeah, I had two questions. Uh, uh, when you're going through basic or whatever, you said you just got up here 15 minutes and you went to chow. Did you do any PT, any 5 or anything like that? Oh, certainly. Basic training was... I had the list of things we did, okay? We had to learn how to take care of our uniforms. We did a lot of marching. We had to get all our shots. We went to classes and we went to PE. We just didn't, the only thing we didn't do that the men did was shoot a gun, gun firearm, or do the obstacle course. We did everything else that they did. Yeah, okay, and then uh, when you're married, were you on, uh, did you live in uh, base housing or all base? No, it's really hard to get base housing. Um, you gotta be a super upper, level sergeant to get something like that. No, we just lived off base. Any final question or two? Okay, right over here. I'll make my way across the room. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I saw in your PowerPoint slide that you took night classes yes. to get your master's degree from USC. No, the night classes were not for my master's degree. Well, I did take night classes, yeah. For my master's degree, yes. I want to congratulate you oh. on that because I know how hard that is to pursue your education. Yes. And also be still enlisted as well. Well, no, that was after I got out of the Air Force. Yeah, that was, was after, no, I got, I got my two degrees. I got out, I had my kids, I got divorced, and then I got my associates, and then I went to ASU and I got my two bachelors. Then, about 10 years after that, I got my master's. Not bad. <laughs> Not bad at all. Anything else? Okay, we've got two more. We've got two more. Bring over here to Denise. First of all, we're so lucky to have you in our program. So thank you so much. And I was just observing Barbara today, and she has her alarm set on her phone so she could sign up for classes and get in them. Um, two different exercise classes at the Y. So this is a lifelong learner and very disciplined and motivated. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, last question. Back to Like I said, I had so many questions and I'll keep it short. Okay. Uh, your children, they uh, end up joining uh, the military? Yes, my son went in the Coast Guard. This is another story. Um, my son, whenever we were on an air, a trip in an airplane, he got airsick. And so he said he didn't want to go in the Air Force. I said, you don't get to fly in the Air Force. You just take care of all the airplanes. You know? But he didn't want to do that. He went in the Coast Guard. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> that was, remember that time when all the Cubans were leaving Cuba? And he was stationed at, down at Key West. And when you're the boot, you're in the bow of the boat. And I mean, we tried. <laughs> We tried all kinds of pills and, and bands and, and things, but because um, you have to be a deckhand for a while because they always need a lot of deckhands. And then um, when it came time for him to choose a, a, a job site, he said, I want to be an electrician because the guy in the electrician's room, he got to stay dry. And uh, then when he was finishing, he was to school almost a year, and when he was finishing his school, um, they said, all right, we're ready to give out assignments, but before we do that, we have some volunteer assignments here. And one of the volunteer assignments was on Attu Island. Does anybody know where Attu Island is? It is the last island on the Aleutian chain, way out there, okay? So he got this job at Attu Island for a year, and then he came back and he got another um, uh, stateside uh, brown job. He could, he could climb a tower, that was no problem. Just don't put me in a boat. But um, no, then they tried to get him to re-enlist. He goes, now, why would I re-enlist in a seagoing service when there's no way in hell I am ever going to see again? So that was, uh, that was his. But no, um, my, my brother was the weather observer. My son was in the Coast Guard. My father had been in World War II. I had two other uncles, that one in the Coast Guard and one in the Navy. So yes, I've got uh, military in my family. Uh-huh. And uh, the uh, criticism 
nightclub was laughable is that we were like the Boy Scouts in the military. Okay, our basic pay was like half that of the Army and the Marine Corps. Oh well. And a side note, I think it was uh, at Two Island where Sarah Payton lived because she could see Russia from her backyard, <laughs> if you remember. I don't All right, so. one more round of applause for Barbara. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.